Amen. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Facebook, YouTube. Thank you for tuning in this evening. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. 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 Praise God. Wasn't that awesome worship? Yes. You know that uh, that first song was that's what led us to name the church. Name the church. That's where where we got the name because that that song is very very dear to me because um, that's one that was played when I went to the altar and surrendered everything. And that was perfect because if you listen to the words of the songs, it just like if it was really speaking to me, you know. Amen. Praise God. So <clears throat> today's message is gonna be uh, we're gonna go through Psalms 41, and I'm gonna go through it the best that I possibly can through the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before Your holy throne this evening, Father God. Father, we just thank you. We praise your holy name. Father God, we thank you for, for a time such as now to bring forth your word, Father God, your truth. Father God, with love, but with boldness. Father God, we thank you for the privilege that you have given us to bring forth your word this evening. Holy Spirit, we just invite you in this place and we ask that you would speak. I submit myself to you. Submit my lips to you that it would be you and not I. So Father, we just thank you, we praise you, in Jesus' holy, holy, holy name. Amen. Amen and amen. Praise God. So, so awesome to be in the house of the Lord once again to bring forth the word. Didn't we have an awesome uh, Easter sunrise service? Yeah. Even though the camera didn't get the Angle of the sun because he couldn't see nothing, but it's okay. It was still good. It still rose. Really enjoyed it. Amen. 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 Praise God. So when everything seems to be falling apart, when troubles come from every direction, when everything looks hopeless, we got to remember that God is in control. We have to understand that nothing that happens or takes place in the world happens without God's approval. However you want to put it, but everything has to come through our Heavenly Father. See, God's kindness and truth remain constant regardless of the circumstances surrounding us. Right now we have a circumstance around us that's really, really bringing so much fear to the people, bringing fear even to the church, to the body of Christ, even to fellow believers. But God wants us to understand and to know that no matter, no matter what kind of things that we are facing, that He's still in control. And that we can still trust Him. Amen? See, the psalmist David wrote of God's consistent graciousness which brought comfort to him, even as he experienced unkindness, hatred, and betrayal from those around him. How many of us have ever experienced that? Amen. It's... See, if we are to be victorious in every situation, we must lay hold of God's precious promises to comfort, guide, and uphold us. Amen? See, Psalms 41 is a lament, lament in which a person has fulfilled his responsibilities to the poor and yet is suffering severely. He prays for God's help and vindication. See, David's message in Psalm 41 speaks of God's tender, loving care in the critical care unit of life, an ICU. And how many of us know that right now the ICU units are very, very busy. They're very, very busy because they have patients in there that are experiencing this, this pandemic, this COVID-19. So we got to remember to continue to pray for these people, continue to pray for their healing. But if you've got the latest report, I always love to rejoice in the ones that have recovered. 
You know, because how many cases that we've had, I think it's like 1,400 or something like that. I mean, I wish that none would have perished and none would have died, but our, our death rate is still low. And our recovery rate is way high. And I believe because that's the, the righteous prayers of the saints that we are coming together and praying for our city and praying for, for all those that have been affected. Amen. See, so through Psalm 41, we're going to see that, rec um, that he recognizes human compassion. Rebel, rebel, rebels in God's care for the compassionate. Request grace, help, and forgiveness. Psalms 1 says, Psalms 41, starting in verse 1, it says, Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. Let's jump over to 1 Peter 4, 8. I love what this it says because it lines up directly with, what we just, with uh, verse 1 of uh, Psalms. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sin. See, there is power in love. 1 Peter 4, 8. There is power in love. Because who established love? Who is love? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. See, we can easily see from the scripture that God wants us to be charitable. He especially wants us to be charitable to those who are worse off. Not only financially, but spiritually than we are. We are to reach out to them. We are to assist them. We are to help them. And there hasn't been such a better time that we can bring hope to the people now. Now that they're desperate because they, they don't have any hope. That's why fear has taken over them. You know, they're, they're like afraid to go out of their house and they're afraid to go to the store and stuff because of the fear. Because of not knowing what's going to take place. See, the best example of this in all the Bible was Jesus. He healed the lame, gave sight to the blind, opened deaf ears, and fed the multitude. See, we know that even the leper who people avoided was touched by Jesus and healed. One of the parables that Jesus told about helping those in need was a parable of the Good Samaritan. Now let's go to Psalms 41, verse 2. It says, The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. Amen? See, we cannot outgive God. If you give to the poor, God will give back to you. If you pray for the sick, God will keep you healthy. If you give a place of rest to someone homeless, you shall always have a bed. Whatever you do for someone else, God will reward you. You cannot give directly to God, but every time you help someone in need, you are giving to the Lord. Man, God is good. See, of course, saint and sinner alike have troubles from time to time. But God will help those who have generously helped others. How many of us are generous? How many of us love to give? Love to give more. I mean, I get, so, I get more blessed when I'm giving and I'm blessing somebody than receiving. Because doesn't it fill our heart with so much joy when you can bring joy to somebody else? Especially in a time like this. See, the type of person who helps others is the follower of Christ. This person already has eternal life in heaven to look forward to. But this says the Lord will keep him safe from his enemies here on the earth. Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, 
He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? When our ways please the Lord, he even makes his enemies at peace with us. Our enemies, those that despise us, those that hate us, whatever you want to say. But man, isn't that awesome? That he'll make even his, our enemies be at peace with us. In verse 3, it goes on and says, The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. See, there are plenty around us who, if not poor in the things of this world, are poor in love and hope and the knowledge of God. The person who considers the poor is kind to them because they are fellow members of God's people. God honors the person who shows such kindness. He delivers him, protects him, and more specifically sustains him on his sickbed. He who considers the poor trusts God, willing to give from his own resources. He who considers the poor is kind to those in need. He who considers the poor helps those who likely will not help him in return. He who considers the poor has a generous heart. So when we're giving to somebody, when we're blessing somebody, are we doing it because we're expecting something in return? Or are we doing it because God has just blessed us tremendously that we're not expecting nothing in return? But that's how we act sometimes. That's how we treat others sometimes. And that's how even we are with God. It's like, well, I did this now, God, now I expect you to bless me. But look around you. Look at your life. Look at you're still breathing air. You have a, hopefully you have a roof over your head. You have a job. Or maybe you're going through some struggles and stuff, but there's so many people that have it so much worse. We have, there's so much to be thankful about. So much to be thankful to our Lord. He who considers the poor gives for their good, not simply to make himself feel good. So why do we give? You know, last night my wife and I were talking and, and you know, like when somebody is going through a hard time in life, What's the most famous words that we know how to say? Hey brother, hey sister, if you need anything, let me know. Right? But how many times do they really call us and, and say, hey, you know what? But what if they do call us? Are we really down with those words and we're like, hey, you know what, right now I can't. I'm busy. Or you know what, hey, I don't have no money then if we really don't mean what we say, then we must not say it at all. And us as believers, we have to take heart in that. We have to, our word has to be as good as gold. When we say something, we have to follow through. So if I'm telling this brother, hey brother, you know what? If you need anything, please let me know. And if they happen to call me at 2, 3 in the morning, and they need prayer, they need something or, or they're going through a struggle, then I gave him my word that I would be there to, for him. And it's happened a lot, a lot, a lot of times. Yeah. But I'm okay with it because I've seen the growth in these men. Mm. See, it's easy to become blind to the needs of others if we only focus on our needs. We must reach out to help others in need. As we do, we will experience God's help when we are emotionally down or physically sick or when we face difficult situations. Let's go to verse 4. I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. 
We have to make that part of our prayer and we have to declare and say, Lord, I have sinned against you. Free me from the bondage of sin. We have to really cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, and that's what I really love about David, about what, I mean, he, that's how come he's called the man after God's own heart because of the trueness of his repentance. He was really purposing, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this right. And I'm not going to go back to that. My enemies speak evil of me. When will he die and his name perish? See, David has set a standard on the side of the Lord on, in his day. Those classified as his enemies were also enemies of the Lord. These enemies thought if he would just die and get out of their way, they could live any way they wanted to without hurting their conscience. See, usually people who speak evil of others are trying to cover up some sin in their own life. They think if they can make someone else look bad, it will make them look better. They would like to get rid of him and his name and die out. See, they were not aware that David would live on. See, God had promised that his descendants would reign. This was really speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will reign as Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Amen. See, Jesus was in the lineage of David in the flesh. So let's continue on in verse 6. And if he comes to see me, he speaks life. His heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes out, he tells it. See, this reminds me of the trouble that Job had. His so-called friends accused him of being a sinful man because he had this disease in his body. They had talked so badly about Job that Job had to pray for them before God would forgive them. See, just as God punished the friends of Job for their iniquity, God will punish those bearers of bad news here. They are only pretending to be his friend. And you know, throughout the years, we've had people come in and people come out of our lives. Some were friends and some were pretenders. But you know, there's something so important that, that for every season, there is like a learning, right? There's something to learn from every season. Even if we're going through a difficult time, even if we're going through a difficult situation in our lives, every season is a, is a time to learn and to grow and to mature in the Lord. See in verses 4 and 4 through 6, it said, it said, a sinner's plea for mercy against evil speaking enemies. Why do people like to gossip about other people? Why do people like to talk about other people? Because it helps them justify their actions, their own actions. You know what I'm saying? So, so we need to tear somebody down so that we can be lifted up. And that's not good. And it happens so much within the body of Christ. It happens so much within the church. And it needs to stop because that's very unhealthy for the body. See, without saying, Lord, be merciful to me. Without saying it directly, David seemed to appeal to God on the basis of his own good works especially consideration of the poor. In light of his relative righteousness and the, 
according to the terms of the old covenant, David could and did ask God for mercy and blessing. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. David knew that he had done much good, but that did not erase his sins. He understood that his sins were directed against God and that they made him like a sick or injured person who needed healing in his soul. His body was sick, but more important was his soul sick. God wants to do a mighty work in each and every one of us. He wants to work in us. He wants to heal us physically, but He's more concerned by healing us spiritually. Now, if, if, if we allow Him to heal us spiritually, then everything else is going to fall into place. Then your body will, your, your body is going to submit to the Spirit of God. And it lines up with our scripture, Matthew 6.33. See, we can identify at least three ways that David says he needed healing for his soul. Heal my soul from its great distress. Heal my soul from the effect of sin. Heal my soul from my tendency to sin. David made a plain and honest confession to his sins when he said, I have sinned against you, Lord. A confession without excuse. A confession without qualification. A confession without super, superficiality. So when, when we're coming to the throne of God and we're confessing our sin, are we really confessing all of our sin? Do we really want to be delivered? Do we really want to be healed? Do we really want to be set free? Because it seems like we like to entangle to the sins, to these little, little, little sins, that, the, these dark sins that, that, that are taking control of us. Or are we bringing it totally to the Lord? And say, Lord, heal me, Lord. Set me free because I have sinned against you. If we can really start seeing our sins and we want to honor God and we start to speak our confessions saying, Lord, I have sinned against you, Lord. It's going to change our whole reality. It's going to change our whole thinking. Because we're going straight to the source. You're not, I'm not going to say, Oh, Lord, forgive me because I yelled at my wife, whatever. Lord, forgive me because I have sinned against you. That was not pleasing to you. See, Saul and Judas each said, I have sinned. But David says, I have sinned against you. Big difference. Big difference. Judas acknowledged his sin, but he didn't acknowledge the one that can deliver him from the sin. But David did. Heal me not, for I am innocent, but I have sinned. How contrary is this to all self-righteous pleading? In verse 7 it says, All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt. They, they talk a lot. They, 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 they murmur a lot. And it's like, I don't like to say, I, you know, you get used to it, but, but it happens. It happens. But is there something to learn from it? Absolutely there is. Can we grow from it? Absolutely. Have we, have we partaken in, in such events? Absolutely we have. But God, we have to understand that God wants to deliver us from that. If you're having your lunch and you're having it with, the, with a lot of people, you know, that you know, they gather, you know, for lunch and they talk about all 
all this stuff, right? And if that's taking place, then we need to find another place to have lunch. Because we should be not taking any part of that. See, that is, they privately conspired against him. In Matthew twenty-two fifteen. Matthew twenty-two fifteen. Did I say Matthew twenty-two fifteen? Yes. <laughs> <That is funny. laughs> then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. They wanted to twist his words. They wanted to. They wanted to kind of like distort his words, right? Not from what he really said. Pretending to be his friends, they are really his enemies. They are two-faced. They do not say these things to his face. They get out and whisper behind his back. They really want to destroy him. Sad. 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 I've always said, whenever we have issues, it's best to go directly to the person that you have the issue with and get it resolved. Mm -hmm. Right? And if you think that it's not going to go well, then you take a witness with you, you take somebody else. That's the way to handle situations. Not to, not to be gossiping and talking about one another. Now let's go to verse 8. An evil disease, they say, cling to him. And now that he lies down, he will rise up no more. See, it's very easy to declare an illness that someone else has as evil. The person can even figure out how this illness is a punishment from God. Haven't we ever met those kind of people? Mm -hmm. Oh man, it's because you're in sin. Oh, it's because of this. It's because of that. And you don't even know the person, right? We have to really be careful about how we approach these things. Like Job's friends confessed, so many ministers today are proclaiming that they, that all illness is because of sin, that just, that just is not true. The disciples asked Jesus, who has sinned, the blind man or his parents? Jesus answered them and said, neither one. We must be careful about proclaiming someone else's illness as a judgment of God. But we're very good at it. We're very, very good at it. Oh, the Lord spoke to me, man, and you're in sin. We've got to be very, very careful. About what we say. We really want to help people in and show them where things that they can get corrected in their life, hold them accountable and help them through their situation, right? Help them through the difficulties of life that they're going through. So let's go to verse 9. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. I'm thinking he's probably talking about his best friend. You invited him into your house, he had your dinner, he sat at your table. The same ones that were
were speaking ill against him. See, one expects enemies to be treacherous, but here the pain of betrayal comes from his close friend who had received only kindness and who has now lifted his heel against the singer. Why? Why do these things take place? Why do these things, how, how can, when, when, when you're with somebody, when, when you're helping somebody, or when, when you have friends, how can we, as a people, be so cruel? You know what I'm saying? If we love God and want to follow His commands, but then again, we're so prideful also. We have so much pride and sometimes I want what my friend has and since I can't have it, I want to start to pout about it and now I'm on a purpose to bring him down. And that's not right. It's not healthy. It's not healthy for your life. It's not healthy for your spirituality. And it's not healthy for your physical body as well. See, it's bad enough for our enemies to speak out against us. But when a close friend turns against you, it's almost unbearable. Judas called Jesus friend. And yet betrayed him. Many of us who are trying to get something done for God have felt this very same hurt. Many times it's your closest friend who you thought had been in total agreement with you. I have even felt this hurt from my own family. There is no way to ignore this type of hurt. The only consolation that we do have is we have not suffered to the extent that our Lord Jesus suffered. Mm -hmm. So why are we complaining? Why do we complain? Instead of complaining about everything, we should be praying about everything, right? But ain't we good complainers? We like to complain. We want people to hear us. We want to be heard. Well, if you want people to hear, then you should become a preacher so that people can start to really pay attention to what you're, to you're speaking. Go out to the street and speak Jesus. Just as you used to complain to everybody about so-and-so and then about this person, about that person, and before you know it, you have 20, 30 people against this one person that none of the stuff is true. Wow. Whispers and betrayal. See, all who hate me whisper together against me. David knew of, or at least could sense, the whispered conspiracies set in motion against him, meant to devise him his hurt. See, this may have been true. David described such a time of illness in Psalms 38, 3 and in Psalms 38, 6 through 8. David's enemies were happy at the thought that he might die and rise up no more. They wanted him to die. They wanted to finish him. We can't imagine how his enemies probably pretended to be friends. Said this of David as he suffered on his sickbed. As David was fighting for his life. His friends were talking like, man, I hope he dies. That's sad to think of your friends wishing that upon you. Even, even, even my own familiar friend whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. David's woe was made more bitter because among his enemies were those who had once been familiar, been a familiar friend to him. He knew what it was like when trusted friends, those he had close relationship with, 
who ate his bread, betrayed him. David was betrayed by his own son, Absalom, in 2 Samuel chapter 15, and by a trusted advisor named Ahito Pal, 2 Samuel 15, 12. So what greater wound can there be than a treacherous friend? How hurt can you be? You know, there's this friend of mine. We've been friends for over 30 years. And throughout those 30 years, you know, we get mad at each other, we make up, we get mad at each other, and stuff like this. But we're still friends. And I told him, I said, man, I said, you know, he's gone to live his life, he has his family, he has his kids, and, and you know, they have their stuff, and we see each other at work and stuff, and uh, we talk and we text and stuff like this, I mean, but I know that if I were to call him in the middle of the night, that he would, he would jump up and be there for me immediately. Yeah. Because I know him. I know his character. So I'm thinking of David. If this brother would, would just betray me and just turn his back and against me, man, I can just imagine how, how that, it would feel so painful like your own brother, right? So I can't even imagine how he felt. His friend that he was hanging out with, and come on, bro, let's, let's you know, these are my speech, okay? I'm gonna say, where's that in the Bible, bro? You call them, bro? No. Okay, so I can just imagine, he's like, you know, let's go to my house and I'll, we'll have dinner, we'll eat at the table, I'll introduce you to, to some of my family. If you need a place to stay, you can crash here. And then little do you know that they're stealing from you. And they're taking your possessions and they're taking your things. Think about that. Even us as believers, I can just imagine how David felt being betrayed. I can imagine how Jesus felt when he walked with these disciples, he was teaching them, he was discipling them, he was, he was there for them, he was praying for them. And then they denied him. You know what I think, I think, honestly, I think it was probably more painful for Jesus to be denied by his disciples than it was when he went to the cross because of his love, the love that he had for these men, the love that he had because he walked with them, he was teaching them, I mean he was joking around with them, I mean he just, they were like his closest friends. In John chapter 13, 8, the word of the Lord says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. I love what Spurgeon says, the kiss of, a, of the traitor wounded our Lord's heart as much as the nail wounded in his hand. Think about that. Because you know, when we, when we make relations, I mean, we're relational people. I mean, we don't, I mean now with the quarantine and, and stuff, I, mean, I love my wife. I really, really adore my wife and it's been such an awesome time, you know, we really got connected, like really connected more during this time, but, but you know, it, it's like, I told my wife, I like enjoy going to work, like really enjoy it now, you know, just getting away 
from the house, you know what I'm saying? Not saying that I don't enjoy being with my wife because I do, but you know what? I'm just digging the grave deeper and deeper and deeper and I'm just gonna shut up right there. I hope, hopefully you guys understand what I'm trying to say. See, there may be people in our lives who hope we will fail. We may feel pressure from such people during times when our relationship with God is weak. I remember when the Lord called my wife and I to, to step out in faith and step out of the boat. It was, I mean, it was really fearful, like for me and my wife. But I, I told my wife, I said, you know, I said, if we don't do it, we're going to kick ourselves because we didn't follow through with the, when the Lord called us. I said, I said, the only failure we have is if we don't step out of the boat, we've already failed. He said, so my wife and I, we stepped out of the boat. But during that time, there were so many people around us that, that told us that we weren't hearing from God and that He didn't speak to us and that, and that we don't know what we're doing. And, and all these like really like negative things. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, man, you guys should be encouraging us and be happy. But it's because a lot of times those people wish they had that much faith to step out of the boat. Like you did. So they're going to do whatever they can to discourage you from accomplishing what God has called you to accomplish. And you know, we're not, we don't have a big old mega church and stuff, but our faith is strong. Our church is strong. And we've never had to beg for bread. And we celebrate six years this, this, this month. Six years. Our church has grown tremendously. And then it's dwindled. And then it's grown. And it's dwindled. But you know, it's just part of ministry. But my focus has always been, I wanted to always leave God's footprint in each person's life. That they can go out and do great and mighty things for the Lord. But it's like, they, you know, a lot of times people want to see, you know, all the doctrine degrees that you have and all the, and all these things, you know. But as long as we have Jesus and His Word, what more do we need? Right? Because yeah. I graduated with an A plus from the School of Hard Knocks. And that's going to teach me not to give, go back there again. You know what I'm saying? But when I did go to seminary, I did it because my mentor at the time, he wanted me to learn. This was before I had knew that God had called me. So I just joined uh, the seminary not to become a pastor, but just to learn. Just to learn the Bible, to learn different things. Of, you know what I'm saying? I never opened up the Bible. And I did it because he asked me to do it. And, and I honored him. So I did it. And I'm glad I did because I learned a lot. But it's not necessary because the Word of God has so much that it can teach us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? See, we need to keep our eyes focused on God. Okay? We need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. He will never let us down. How many of us know that He will never live, let us down? He will never leave us or forsake us. Amen. Even during the pandemic of the coronavirus, He's with us. He's our shield. He's our helper. All we have to do is cry out to Him. Hmm. So let's go to verse 10. Verse 10 says, But you, O Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them. David is asking God to heal him, but more than that, to show these people that the Lord had not abandoned him. This very thing happened to Job. Job was restored of all that he had lost. 
In fact, God gave him twice as much as he had before. Can you even imagine how those who opposed Jesus felt on resurrection morning? They're like, wow, man, we crucified him and we were like beating him up and now like, what's going on? They're like, man, maybe everything that he said is true. Right? Why were the soldiers right there at the bottom of the cross? You know, they were, they were rolling dice for parts of his clothing. Because they knew what was up. Even Pontius Pilate, was, he wanted to wipe his hands clean from it. He was letting the people choose. Because he wanted to, he didn't want no part of it. Because he knew. I mean, you, you have to know something when, when the most holiest man is right before your, 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 your person. You have to know that this man is set apart from everyone else. There is something special about this man. But check this out. God has given us that same ability, that same power. When we enter a room, people have to recognize that there is something different about this man. There is something that's setting him apart from the rest of the group. There is something that's setting him apart from everyone else. Because what they can see is the light that's in us. It's Christ that, that illuminates out of us. But are we being that light? Are we being that light? Or do we tend to forget at times? what our responsibility is as believers. Wow. So let's go to verse 11. By this I know that you are well pleased with me, because my enemy does not triumph over me. David knows that God is with him, because his enemies did not overwhelm him. See, sometimes it takes a while for us to be victorious over our enemies. But if we do not doubt God, we shall be victorious. At the end, we're going to win every single time, but we have to stay fast in His Word. We have to stay fast in His presence. And we got to remember that when we enter a room, Jesus is entering, the Holy Spirit is entering, God is entering. That's what the kind of authority we need to we need to enter the, the place of business wherever we're at. But sometimes we don't, and let me tell you why sometimes we don't. Because we want to mangle with the gossipers, we want to mangle with the sinners, we want to mangle with everybody else, and we want to take part of all that stuff. But if people know that we're believers, then we're gonna start to feel a little bad, like, like you know what I'm saying? So we can wanna kinda keep it on the down low. So we can like be like a little bit good, like at least I'm the, the best one of the group. You know what I'm saying? But I still entangle with the gossip and, and with the talking about this and that and stuff. No. That's a lot of times why we, it's so hard for us to share our faith. Because if we share our faith with somebody, now that relationship is going to change. It's going to differ. But man, we've had some amazing talks when we talk about people and, and we talk about our co-workers and we talk about this person and we talk about that person. Man, it's fun. So if I witness to him, our relationship is going to change. And he's not going to feel comfortable talking like that anymore around me. So now it's not going to be fun. Right? You guys looking at me like the mom, the only one that's ever been there. I'll admit it. I've been there. I, I liked to gossip and talk. As you guys know that I'm a talker, you know? In verse 12 it says, As for me, you uphold me in your integrity. Integrity is a word that we've taken and just got rid of it. Period. Integrity is a very important word as believers, as Christians. Integrity 
means so much to God. Integrity. We need to be men and women of integrity. We need to uphold ourselves in that kind of manner. And we need to have that integrity. See, the singer returns to the faith described in verse 1 through 3. Because of his faith, he can be confident that God will continue to honor his integrity, specifically his kindness to the poor. David is saying here that the Lord not only saved him, but saved his good name as well. This is like the Christian who is saved. They are not only saved from further sin in this life, but for all of eternity as well. David knows that God has forgiven him and that this is forever. Amen? David prayed for mercy from God and triumphed over his enemies. O oh Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them. David prayed not only for forgiveness and deliverance, but also for triumph over his enemies. See, as the Lord's anointed, he felt justified in this and looked for God's deliverance as evidence that God was well pleased with him. Amen. You, uphold, you uphold me in my integrity. David felt that in contrast to his enemies, he was a man of integrity. Still, he needed God to uphold him in his integrity, recognizing that it was God's work in him and not his. And set me before your face forever, Lord. This was the most important thing to David, more important than triumph over his enemies, to be set before the face of God, meant to enjoy his favor and fellowship, amen? We notice all the benefits of verses 11 and 12 are in the present tense. See, David did not believe that God would bring them to him. He believed that he had them already. Amen? And finally, let's go to the 13th verse. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Blessed be the Lord of Israel. Many commentators believe that this is an end not only to this psalm but to the first book of Psalms. Here Yahweh is honored as the covenant. Okay? God of Israel. It was fitting for David to end the song with his eyes on the Lord, not upon himself or his enemies. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord is to be praised as the eternal God stretching from eternity past to eternity future. The Lord is to be praised and I'm going to close with this. No matter, no matter what is it that we're going through, no matter what is it that we're facing, whatever trouble, whatever's troubling us right now, God wants to deliver you. God wants to deliver us. He wants to set us free from the bondage of sin, but we must first come to Him and say, Lord, I have sinned against thee. Forgive me for all of my unrighteousness. You know, when I read the Psalms, David was a man just like us. He went through things. He went through a lot of things. But he always purposed to come back to the Father and to openly praise Him and cry out to Him and ask God for His forgiveness. Why? Because He had sinned against Him. He admitted His sin. That's all we have to do. 
to come to the Father is we have to admit that we have sinned against our Lord. See, until there is acknowledgement of our sin, it's impossible for God to deliver us from our sin. So right now, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, if you joined us this evening live, or if you're watching at a later time, you're not watching by accident. You're watching because God has called you. And He wants to forgive you your sin. He wants to set, set you free from whatever it is that you're dealing with, whatever it is that you're going through. He wants to set you free. He wants to set you free and He wants you to Come to Him. So right now, I just want to, I want to just pray with you. If, if you never have given your life to Jesus, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, I encourage you to do so now. I encourage you to, to right where you're at, give your heart to Jesus. Ask Him to come in and to clean you and to, to, to cleanse you with His blood. There is power in His blood. So right now I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you, but it's the faith behind the prayer. So just say, Father, I come to you this day knowing that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Tonight, I ask you, Jesus, to be Lord of my life, to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you were resurrected. You rose on the third day to cleanse me from my sin. So right now, I, I just ask you to come and be Lord of my life and help me to follow your commands. Help me follow your commandments. Help me follow you. From this day forward, I will purpose to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you just prayed that prayer, I welcome you to the family of God. You know, there's a party going on in heaven right now on your behalf, and I'm rejoicing with you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. We love you. We would like to invite you to come and visit us once we get this whole um, pandemic thing situated or whatever, but follow us. You must be following us on Facebook and we'll keep you posted. But if you need a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, uh, send me a message and then I will get you a Bible. I will send one to you. Or you can give the church office a call at uh, 505-261-5667. I just pray and hope that from this day forward that God will just do an amazing work in your life. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your holy throne this evening, Father God, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for all those that are watching live this evening, Father God, or that are going to be watching at a later time. I thank you for them, Father God, and I pray for them right now in the name of Jesus. That whatever it is that they're facing, whatever it is that they're going through, maybe it's fear, whatever it is, Father God, that you would set them free right now. For those that gave their hearts to you, their lives to you for the first time, Father God, I pray for them as well, Father God, that that, that seed will just grow tremendously, Heavenly Father, in them, and that they will be set free from the power of sin. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. God bless you.